good afternoon. Can you all hear me clearly? Yes. That's great. My children have said they've always heard me clearly. That usually means I shout. Um, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I always enjoy coming back to my homeland, although I consider myself a pom -oz, which is a hybrid these days. But it's really lovely to come back and have a chance to be amongst, you know, a culture that I'm very familiar with and also to have the pleasure to speak here. And I do thank the organisers, Anthony and the crew, for a, for a wonderful effort with this. I think they've done an amazing job. And um, I would certainly like to thank them for that. Um, unfortunately, the last time I was due to speak here was when Graham Birdsell sadly died just a week before the conference. And I think he set up amazing tradition and I have got a wonderful feeling that Anthony and his crew are going to do a similar thing. And I hope that you'll always support them because I think, you know, I know what it's like to set up something like this. And I think they've done an incredible job with that. So I would like to thank them for that. Thank you. Well, today, um, what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about what has been my research of 1,600 cases so far. And what I believe is happening, at least from my limited perspective, because I think anybody who thinks they've got a mandate on this is fooling themselves, because we literally are seeing this through a little tiny window. And all of us have got bits of the puzzle, so I think if we honour each other's research, we may get a better sense of what's going on. Remember that we are only seeing a very small percentage of those that are prepared to look at this within their own experience. So with that in mind, I can only give you thoughts and feelings or perhaps a tentative hypothesis of what may or may not be part of what's happening to this planet and our interaction with these cosmic advanced intelligences. So I'm starting off with what I call the star children. Now I believe that over the last 60, 70, maybe 80 years there's been an acceleration of our development in terms of our evolution. And my sense is probably because these advanced intelligences are seeing what we're up to down here. And it's almost like what, we can, what is going on is that they've got a three-year-old with a loaded gun. And they're trying to say, oh my goodness, we've got to wake this, these lot up very fast. Otherwise, they're not only going to destroy themselves, they're going to destroy um, the rest of us or at least interact with us. And we're not ready for that kind of primitive behavior. So let's start off. Um, the reason I've put this down is because for me, um, what I've had to do as someone who came from a very, very um, third dimensional um, scientific paradigm, I was a nurse and midwife 30 years ago. In fact, if you told me 30 years ago that I would be get, traveling the world speaking about aliens and UFOs, I'd have probably sent you to the nearest psychiatrist and said Prozac's really good. The bottom line is that 30 years later, here am I doing this, and it's been an interesting journey, which I think has been very much echoed in the clients that have come to me. I've had to remove everything that I could possibly think of I thought was true and re-examine it. And I've had to re-examine it in, with this whole hypothesis in mind. And it's been amazing how it's all fitted together in such a better way than it did when I was educated into the third dimensional belief system. So I do sit down before fact and I keep my mind open because I don't know what's impossible and I don't know what I don't know. First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Tracy Taylor. Some of you may be aware of her. I just want you to hear a little bit about how she speaks about her understanding of her experiences. My name is Tracy Turner and um, I'd like to share with you some of my experiences and some of the drawings that I have been doing um, that have come from my experiences with extraterrestrials. Um, since I was a very young child, about the age of two or three, I remember having experiences with beings that um, were definitely not human and um, most of those experiences have actually very, been very positive. Um, it was quite normal for me as a child to have these experiences and I thought that everyone else was having the same experiences until I grew up um, and became a teenager and realised that it was quite unusual and I didn't find anyone else to be having these type of experiences and um, being taken up onto strange craft and flying around the place. Um, it's been quite a journey and through my teenage years it was very difficult to relate 
to um, other people of my age. Uh, I, at the age of 15, um, found that I had healing abilities, and this came from um, learning from my experiences with these ETs uh, how to do this um, using my hands, and that was very natural to me. Um, my family, though, um, really didn't have much of an idea about this sort of thing, and um, even though they've been very, very supportive through this, uh, of course, they, they really didn't know how to take my idea of being able to heal with my hands. Um, through up until about the age of 17, I um, had these abilities and psychic abilities, which I did end up repressing quite a bit because I thought I was going crazy. And um, I went to seek professional help. I went to psychologists and psychiatrists and had head scans and CAT scans, ECGs done, and um, obviously nothing was found. But um, more recently, over the past three years, I've been finding uh, myself doing geometric type drawings that seem to come to me through um, these experiences. And I find I have this urge to draw and I sit down and my hand seems to just take over and uh, when I um, try to have conscious input into what I'm doing uh, it doesn't seem to work my hand stops so I usually need to be sidetracked by watching TV or talking to someone or you know being on the phone and um, these geometric designs come through I did a series of uh, about eight black and white ones which uh, after I completed them uh, I was told during a dream to put them onto transparency paper and that they'd fit together. And I thought, okay, well, I'll go and do that. Um, and I actually met Mary Rodwell, and, which was a lifesaver, and went to a support group meeting with some other experiences, and they all sat down and put them together in a way that I hadn't tried before. I'll be showing you these and show you how they fit together. Uh, I will now walk you through the drawings and explain to you some of the symbology and some of the explanations that have come through within me um, about what they mean. The black and white ones that fit together, I ultimately hope to have them put onto computer in 3D, um, as I've been told that it'll explain a little more about what they actually mean. I'm not going to show you the drawings right now. There is um, a DVD that I've done which is called Expressions of ET Contact, a visual blueprint, where Tracy explains this. But what I wanted to show you was that for Tracy it was normal to be aware that she was on a spacecraft at five. She soon learnt not to talk about it at school for obvious reasons. The fact that she found that she had healing abilities when she was 15. Now Tracy was quite um, amazing in the fact that she put her through, herself through the psychiatric um, uh, what would you call it, um, scheme of things. And what they found was that there was nothing psychologically wrong. She actually faced a panel of eight psychiatrists in Melbourne and she held nothing back. She told them of the beings that she saw, she showed them the drawings that she did and her experiences. And it, fascinatingly, not one of those psychiatrists said that they thought that she was in any way mentally ill. In fact, they wished her luck. What they made of it is um, obviously something that is, is um, personal to them. So what Tracy says, and what a lot of my clients are telling me, um, and that's even here I found um, some people telling me about the strange drawings that they did, which they download unconsciously but are managing to reproduce. This is what she says about what she feels is happening on this planet. There's a race of beings on, upon the planet increasing in number, although visually and physically indistinguishable to most humans. They are the bringers of the new, the bringers of light. They're here to guide the awakening of terrestrial consciousness. Now, what I wanted to know was, where is the evidence? Because that sounds wonderful, and I do believe that this is what's going on. But we need to look at the evidence. She also talks about the fact that the DNA of the star kid has tenfold the amount of information. So we have to look at that and we have to say, well, where again is the evidence of that? Many, many of those that would see themselves as star kids or indigos, crystals, golden children, children of light, the metaphysical community has many names for these different types of um, children being born now. 
And they, I mean, even ordinary grandparents, if I speak to the Rotary or I'm t talking at a library, will say the grandparents will notice that their grandchildren are different somehow, even although they can't quantify it. So this is something that's been noticed in mainstream. I meet teachers that tell me the children are different now. So what is the evidence? First of all, what I have discovered is that it's global. And in the Himalayas, there's evidence of children there that show strange behavior. Children using unknown sign languages. Children who draw pictures of triangular objects flying in the sky. And that they communicate with telepathy with unseen ETs. So this is in the Himalayas. We have in Mexico similar kind of story. Mexican children that also manifest similar behavior. Many in the area reporting a long time UFO sightings, young children, extra agile, this is how the, um, it was written, and very talented. Their problem-solving skills have increased. They're much more disciplined, continually using strange sign language among themselves. And in Mexico City alone, a thousand children have been identified who are able to see with various parts of their bodies. And I actually saw on a DVD um, a young lady of 17 and not only could she, when she was blindfolded, actually describe with a hand, scanning the, the photograph, what was on the photograph, but when they put a newspaper under her feet, she could read the headlines through her shoes. So it seems like we've got abilities that we are only just tapping into. What's fascinating also in China, um, there's been discovered um, that a lot of children in China with similar abilities. And Paul Dong calls these um, China's super psychics. And they are also showing amazing psychic and intuitive abilities. They have the ability to open flower buds with thought alone, display telekinetic abilities, as well as other fascinating multidimensional skills, such as sensing others' thoughts. Being reported that the Chinese government has observed these children changing the human DNA molecule in a Petri dish before cameras and scientific equipment to record this supposedly impossible feat. There are many, many other things that they actually have um, been able to identify, and these children are now being fostered and being um, encouraged throughout China. So what do the star kids themselves tell me? That not only do they have memories of being on spacecraft and being educated, they often have past life memories, including ones where they are not human. Information they have not consciously learned seems to be downloaded in many different ways, and I'm going to talk about the downloads in a minute. They have a sense of purpose, a sense of mission. They feel, excuse the pun, alienated on this planet. They find other human beings actually quite barbaric. And they'll say to me, I can't understand how we operate on this planet. It seems really, really primitive. And they are very intelligent and intuitively creative. So what other evidence do we have that we are changing as a species? Dr. Atwater talks about the extreme jump in intelligence between 24 to 26 points and now concerns non-verbal intelligence, the ability to know and intuit information in the area of genius once ranked scores between 134 and 136, a preponderance of today's youth test between 150 and 160, many over 184. No precedent explains this. And if you are interested in the prophecies, um, in fact, Edgar Cayce, maybe well known to a number of you, actually talked about something called the fifth root race that would manifest on this planet around the year 2000. So I'm looking at it from a, a number of levels to see if we can actually qualify this material. Dr. Roger Lear may be well known to some of you. Um, he wrote the book, The Aliens and the Scalpel. He's taken out at least 15 implants from different individuals now, which has been fully recorded. And the information on these implants on double blind shows anomalies that cannot be explained. For example, there is no rejection um, by the body of these implants. They're highly magnetized. And there are many other components to these um, implants that cannot be explained. What he also has done, which a lot of people don't know about, is looked at the evidence for these star children. And he gave me one of his many, many um, statistics here. And uh, this is just one to demonstrate 
um, a little bit more how we may have evidence that we are now changing as a species. The age of gate, saying simple words, repeating simple sentences, complex sentences, developmental changes in children between 1947 in America and 1987 alone. And if you look at the statistics, the increase in 1987 um, from uh, 1947 on some levels is as much as 83% acceleration. We've got 60, 66% and what have you, if you look to the right of the um, table here. And what Dr. Lear is talking about is really quite fascinating. He's actually saying that he believes this is not due to better prenatal care, that he believes it's um, part of a very active interaction with alien <coughs> acceleration of our evolution through alien intervention in our bodies and minds. So Tracy Taylor, many of these children born these days have memories intact from their previous existence on board craft as extraterrestrials. They're kept on track by continuing their interaction with their cosmic family while they're in human form. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more and what people have not only conscious memory of, and this is very, very important, that 80% of this is conscious memory. A lot of people think the only way we get this information is through hypnosis, and this is conscious memory. We get a lot more detail through hypnosis, although I will actually quote jo Dr. John Mack, which some of you may be interested and know of, who was the professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, who wrote the book Abduction and Passport to the Cosmos. And in it he said, actually, he believes that the information through hypnosis is far more accurate than conscious memory, and his reasoning for that is that the subconscious does not edit the information that our conscious mind edits. So we are more likely to get the truth, believe it or not, through regression hypnosis than we do through conscious memory, which goes contrary to many's, uh, many other people's information on that. And I find that fascinating, and I actually agree with him. OK, so this is a five-year-old statement that the mother came to me about not only her own experiences, but her five-year-old son. And he said one day to her, I don't mind going through the walls, and I learn more on the ships than I do at school. This is a five-year-old child, and I'm going to tell you some stories about the children, because I believe the children are really giving us a very accurate understanding of their experiences, because they don't watch talk shows. These are how they understand them. And this is an experience of a young man um, uh, who drew this, uh, Mr. Finch, who actually, this was his experience, the balls of light and the ET coming through the wall. And this is what this five-year-old continued to say. They only come at night. They float, not walk, and become invisible. And there are blue ones, too, like the ones I've seen in my mind's eye. We're still talking about a five-year-old child here. And this is quite fascinating because, again, this isn't what they see on TV with the Teletubbies, although I'm going to go to that in a minute. This is a very interesting account by um, a social worker's daughter. And she did think she was going crazy when one day she was looking in her lounge room and she saw three insect-like beings there. And she just had a daughter and she thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm a social worker, I know this is crazy, until somebody knocked on the door. And it was a friend of hers and she came in and, you know, she was very pleased to see her because she really thought she was going crazy. And this woman said to her, do you realize that you've got three strange beings in your lounge room? And she said, you can see them too. This is her daughter. Um, well, should I say this picture was in her daughter's bedroom one morning. And the little girl, she was just over two, and she said, Mommy, I had a visitor in my room last night. And she took me up and up somewhere, and she gave me something to eat. And the, um, uh, the uh, mother said to her, but who did the drawing? And she said, oh, that was the lady. Now, if you look here, you've got an archetypal being. Now, that's quite interesting. And the, the paranormal side to this can be very confronting to a lot of people, because obviously her daughter only did scribble drawings. So how it got there is quite fascinating. And I'm going to talk about how I believe these advanced intelligences are trying to wake us up. 
This is uh, what a young lady of eight said to her mum about what is known as knowledge bombs or downloading of complex information that many experiencers tell me they have when they have encounters. And she explained it like this. Sometimes I get a headache, my head's so small. I can't always take it in so quickly. It's like knowledge bombs are being dropped on my head, which is a very interesting way to explain what she was experiencing. And another young lady. Um, this was a five-year-old girl talking to her mother about the fact that her mother found it quite strange that the baby, her little sister, wasn't hungry in the morning, which she normally was. And the older sister, who was only five, said they'd been taken up into a spaceship. And she said they're like giant Teletubbies and they sit cross-legged and meditate. They take the baby too and they feed her. Now, whether or not they actually look like Teletubbies or whether or not they're using, as they do, like screen memories, an image that the child is familiar with so that they're not frightened. But what was fascinating was that she was talking about sitting cross-legged and meditate. What child of five talks like that? This is a drawing done by a four-year-old child. Um, and the mother came up to me and said, um, this is one of the drawings my son's done. And he said, mummy, this is the man that comes and gets me. And as you can see, there's no ears, there's no hair, there's no mouth, there's no nose. And he's, had a, um, he's actually tried to draw a few more. This is drawn by a four-year-old. And there you can see a triangular craft. And he said the one is, he's even done a side view. Now we're talking about a four-year-old child here. And what's fascinating is he's done an energy field. And what child knows about an energy field around a craft? And he said the energy field was to stop the people from getting, coming, going in and out. To, in other words, his interpretation was it was to keep them, keep them there. Now, this is a very interesting story in the sense that the lady had had a lot of experiences and encounters. And she said that her daughter was only barely 18 months old. And she went to the bookcase. And of all the books in the bookcase, there was only one she took out. And it was this one. And she said, Mummy, in her little toddler voice, Clowny, Clowny comes and gets me. And Clowny, the screen memory for the ET, and she pointed to the face, comes and gets me. Bianca later, when she was a little bit older, actually drew Clowny. And this is the craft that she said she goes on. She even pointed to the window that she looks out of. And the craft, which is the green one, where she goes up to the main, main craft or the mother craft. And this is what she says about um, Clowney. Clowney sometimes takes me in his spacecraft. The colors are gray and black. I get there because Clowney flies, not with wings. He floats. Clowney's energy field. Clowney used to scare me, but my mum and dad said he's my friend. I thought Clowney was stealing me, but he was healing me. Clowney said he will protect everyone in the family. And Clowney's colors are white, yellow, red, pink, and blue. Clowney's like a friend to me and takes me away at night sometimes. It's not very often anymore. He used to take me a lot when I was little, but I think it's because I've seen everything up there already. This is another picture of Clowney. Sorry about the blue background. But again, she's actually saying a little bit more about Clowney. Her brother also sees Clowney. And he's slightly younger, and his mother also told me that Clowney sees angels as well. And this, again, you can see that they've got little wobbly um, legs, which um, looks as though the being is floating, and three digits. Um, a similar kind of thing. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the paranormal side of this, because this is part of it. And many people experience this. Things go missing, and then they find them again. Taps or, or um, electronics turn on and off. Um, the electrical field of the experiencer seems to be one that does seem to affect a lot of the electronic equipment. But this was particularly interesting, and I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to just think about it for yourself. This particular book was taken up to bed every night by that five-year-old little boy where you saw the pictures. And he used to, as his mother say, scan the book with his hand. And he used to then, the next night, give it to his sister to take up to bed. And the mother had no idea why he would do that. But what really confronted her was not the fact that he scanned each page with his hand, was the fact that one morning, both children came down with a book. How did that happen? Well, I usually throw that back to the star kids themselves. And I actually talked to a young man who was 17 years old. And I said, 
Would you have an exp any explanation of this? Because for me, this is quite, quite confronting. And he said this, and I'm going to throw it out to you. Make of it what you will. He says this. The child reading the book with his hand was scanning the pages with his palm. The palm of the hand is a strong energy channel, known as a minor chakra. So by scanning this way, the child was reading the energy signature, not the words. He could pick up the essence of the story through the author's emotions and moods at the time of creating the words. He could still enjoy, and to some extent, understand the story in this way, but through an emotional journey, rather than allowing the words to stimulate the imagination, as most mortals do. As for reproducing the same book, well, that's easy. We can manipulate time, as time in a linear sense just doesn't exist. It's a human invention to separate events and to make sure you conform to what is expected in your lives. All the child did was go backwards, through time if you like, and bring the same book back to the present with him. So the sister had the same book literally. Now, this is a 17-year-old young man. You can make of that whatever you wish, but I found it quite fascinating because I'm going to talk about what's taught on the craft, and one of them is about time. This is a drawing of a 10-year-old girl. This being came to her, into her bedroom. She was very, very frightened at the time. Um, but you notice it's got a flat head. And again, no nose and no mouth. But what was interesting, a 13-year-old girl drew some with flat heads as well, as well as the egg-shaped heads, which again is just showing you how in different parts of the world they correlate. Now this is a particularly interesting story because it's two brothers. One was 11 and one was 13. And this lady wrote to me from Vancouver. And what she told me was that the next morning, both her sons talked about a spacecraft being above the house the night before and taking them on that spacecraft. Now, this is two children saying the same thing. The younger child was actually talking about the, um, this strange being. He was in an auditorium, which you can see there, with other children in pajamas. And he's talking about being taught things. And he said the lady was um, looked unemotional. She had no ears, no eyebrows, the nose was just slits, there were no fingernails, and her face had no expression. And he, he said that he didn't feel particularly frightened, but he was being taught something. The brother, however, said that he also saw beings there, and this long implement that he's holding was actually um, nothing to do with um, a, a weapon, but was something he said was like an anaesthetic. He felt these beings were like scientists and they were curious about us. And he was told it was something to do with genetics. And this is a 13-year-old child talking like this. And this is um, what she said. He felt the devices were more like tranquilizers than for killing. And, he said, and she said, the older boy felt uncomfortable remembering the details, the same as his brother. They both remember a light in their bedroom. And the uh, older brother remembers the little one um, being upset. If I have to go on the spaceship, then I'm bringing my teddy. And his older brother was helping him find it because he knew they didn't have much time. Now, you have to ask yourself, when you get such detail, is this really a fantasy? And the fact that they were both describing similar things. She's also a lady who's had experiences. She often sees UFOs, as you can see, um, one just um, to the right of your screen. And also orbs seem to be around her children quite a bit. And that's something else that seems to be part of this as well. So let's have a little bit more of a look on what this is all about. With the orbs, by the way, I'll tell you something that I mention in another presentation. I'm finding that this seems to be relevant to the whole experience and counter um, experience. A young 15-year-old boy, actually someone that I worked with here in Britain, when he was exploring an experience where some beings were visiting him, he, he was actually mentioning what the beings looked like. And then he said, oh, he said, there's two orbs of light here. And I said, so what, you know, what are they? And he said, oh, he said, it's Grandad and Uncle Ted. And he said, they're here too. And I said, so that's what the orbs of light are? And he said, oh, yes. He said, they're here so I won't be frightened. And interestingly, when the beings went back on the craft, so did the orbs of light go with him. And that will lead into some more information that I want to um, cover with you. So what she's saying, Tracy is saying here, is that 
What's happening at the moment is something that will bring about a global awakening. It's happening already with the children born without <coughs> programs. Now, one of the things that um, I understand through my research is our third dimensional paradigm is very limiting to us if we are to ever ex a, um, expand and grow in a multidimensional way. So what is happening is I believe there are programs on this planet now that are in a way helping us to make that shift. And I'm going to probably create a bit of controversy here by saying that it's quite possible such things as ADHD, autism and Asperger's may be part of those programs. And the reason I'm saying that is that all those um, different, um, and we call them a dysfunction at the moment, um, seem to be able to be more multidimensionally aware. They're able to see a greater reality, and many of them have encounters, and many of them also, you know, apart from seeing angelic beings, see these other beings. Now, there's a gentleman, Neil Gold, in Hong Kong, and Neil Gold's just written his own story, and he, in his manuscript he calls it Close Encounters of the ADHD Kind. And he has always said, that he's experienced a greater reality through his so-called dysfunction, ADHD. So it is something that I am looking at. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying it's something that intrigues me because interestingly, the ADHD child really struggles with our um, whole paradigm in the sense that they struggle with um, even learning um, what we normally have to learn at school. They seem to be operating at a faster pace but I'll go into that a little bit more if I have time. So the cosmic human, what do we know from the experiences themselves? They're highly intelligent, they perceive other realities, they see unusual beings and or strange orbs of light, they ha all have a sense of mission, they manifest healing abilities, and they have an urge, at least some of them, to write um, in strange symbols, strange artwork, or come out with a variety of really unusual languages which they say feels more comfortable to them than their own native tongue. And they have a wonderful sense of euphoria when they speak them. And this has been quite fascinating to me because if someone wants evidence that this is a reality, this is not something you manifest after a hallucination or a fantasy. This is a real tangible way that people change after their experiences. Dr. Boylan talks about the star child of both human and extraterrestrial origin. And a lot of my research is indicating that not only are we a hybrid species, but some of us actually have um, a number of different kinds of DNA, not just human, not just potentially gray or zeta, but sometimes those called manta, which is the insect-like beings, and possibly many, many others. And that is what they're told on the craft, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more. Again, what evidence these children are about, there are many all over the world, and one of them that's been researched a little bit on Project Camelot, for any of you that want to know a little bit more about the whistleblower material, um, the Camelot team went to Russia and met Bariska, and he was, um, it was interesting because he came to my attention because this young man still had memories as a child of actually being um, born on Mars. And he talked about visiting the Earth. And he talked about Lemuria. And this is some of the things that he talks about. He actually um, said that, he, um, that Lemuria existed 800,000 years ago. They were nine meters tall. He stated the people will find knowledge under the pyramids. And he said also life will change once the Sphinx is opened and that the opening mechanism is behind its ear. He also talked about the Martian civilization, megalithic cities and spaceships and flights to various planets as well as Earth. He had an amazing understanding of cosmology. He talked about the gifted kids and they were called indigo. He said he knew of them and something was going to happen on Earth, they are of great importance, and they will be able to help people. He also was an amazingly advanced child. He could hold his head up in 15 days, spoke his first word at four months, at the age of seven months, constructed his first sentence. He had exceptional memory, and not only talked about Mars, but planetary systems and distance civilizations, which is absolutely fascinating. And two little anecdotes I will tell you is a five-year-old child um, in Australia. His mother was talking about the pyramids and 
He got very angry with her when she said that slaves pulled all the stones and built them to make the pyramids. And he said, no, mummy, he says, you've got it all wrong. You don't know because I was there. And he said, they changed the density structure of objects large and small, and they levitated the stones into place. And they placed a crystal on the top to communicate with other worlds. And there's information in the Sphinx, but they haven't found it yet. We're talking of a five-year-old child saying that. Five. And then I went to Adelaide about a year and a half later hearing this, and I met a lady there in her 70s. And in the 1950s, when she was on her farm, she told me, that uh, this strange structure she saw outside her farm and she thought the Shire had built it overnight because it looked so strange. She stood underneath and immediately found herself in a spacecraft with blonde haired beings with blue eyes. And from that time onwards, they actually spoke and taught her many, many things. And she'd never spoken about this ever in her life before until she came to this conference in Adelaide. And she said, Mary, they told me about the pyramids. Now she hadn't heard my presentation. And she said, you know, she said they levitated those stones into place. She said, and it wasn't who they thought, you know, we think it was. And she said, and they placed a giant crystal on the top, which communicated with other worlds. And I'm just thinking, hold on a minute, there's a bit of deja vu here. And then, she, so I actually showed her what this little boy had said. And she said, but what about the spaceship? And I said, what spaceship? She said, the spaceship under the pyramids. I have no idea if she's right, but isn't it interesting? Doris Cannon does a lot of similar work to me. She's written many, many different books, 14 in total now. And she gets, through her regressions, a lot of information that confirms what I'm finding in my regressions. And this is all to do with the expanded DNA. And I think we have to look at every avenue of information to see if we can qualify it in whatever way we can. And this is what she's found in some different people. I'm giving you um, about three different um, bits of information from different clients that she had. One of them said this, DNA has been expanded to 12. We will have lighter bodies, eat less, more liquids, and have difficulty processing heavy, dense foods. There'll be immunity to disease and increased mental powers. Another one, tens of thousands of people are affected. It's when humankind reaches critical mass. The hundredth monkey syndrome will become a reality and this higher consciousness will affect others on the planet. Then, another one, there's been upgradings done. The human brain's upgraded too. The genetics are changing. There's more capacity. It's different wiring. It's different configuration. And another client, several have, uh, she said, have unexpectedly gone to somewhere else into a past life, and it's not Earth. Some of them are emotionally considering it home. And often it's a hostile environment. It's hard to explain, she said, why they would have such a powerful and emotional connection to a desolate alien planet instead of their Earth home. Even though they don't know where home is, they have this longing to go home. And I bet there's some people in this room that know exactly what I'm talking about. I call these people star children, and I have discovered them all over the world. Now, Dolores Cannon is very well known. She's gone to so many different countries and has her books translated in 28 languages now. So, um, and worked for 40 years gathering this information. Many, many letters I get, and this is just one example. I'm in my 40s. I started walking at eight months, talked in sentences by 10 months, knew how to read at two years old. No one taught me. I attended school at night. I had friends who walked through walls, became invisible, and we spoke telepathically. I desperately wanted to go home. Now, a young man who's now in his 30s told me many things he could do as a child. And what he says about his experiences now is this. Remembering what I did before is like remembering a dream. It does not mean it's not real. It means that the mechanical thought processes lie outside my now normal conscious thinking. It lies on the outer ridges of the mind. You just have to find the edges and go further. And this is what he told me. I'm picking out a number that you might um, find interesting. He said, I could take hard boiled eggs from boiling water with my bare hands. There's a young man in um, U the UK, um, that Anne Andrews' son, who told me he could do exactly the same thing, Jason. 
I had a lady when I was speaking in uh, Western Australia in her 60s, when I was talking to a group there, came up to me silently afterwards and said, you know, Mary, I could do that. She's in her 60s now. I could turn out streetlights with my mind. I would have telepathic conversations with my sister until she told me to stop being lazy and start talking. This is so common. This is so common. The parents that have said to me how freaky it is that their child picks up on their thoughts. And one lady said to me, you know, I would be thinking, oh, I'll, I'll give him baked beans for lunch. And before I say anything, he'll say, yes, baked beans will be fine, mum. It can be very confronting. And I'll tell you those that are teachers here, watch out, because a lot of these star kids can read your minds. And I remember a 13-year-old girl telling me, and she said, it's really awkward, Mary, she said, because I know what my teacher's thinking. And what she's thinking and what she's saying are two different things. And sometimes what she's thinking isn't very nice. <laughs> so watch your thoughts. Traits of a star child. And I'm going very quickly here because I'm trying to give you a big overview here. They seem to, um, it, it appears that they may well have superior mental and analytical capabilities. They have a direct connection to higher awareness, extreme sensitivity to thought and emotion, enhanced DNA, photographic memories, fast motor neuron responses. They know how to manipulate time and space, which is taught on the craft, and I'm going to talk a bit about that in a minute. And they are very good at nonverbal communication. And I'm going to go and give you some evidence, because you're probably thinking, oh, well, this sounds all very wonderful, but where's the evidence? But first of all, I want to, for those of you that are having experiences, and I am not in any way denying how difficult this is and how traumatic many have, um, the trauma that many have initially when they realize that they're being visited. And I'm that, in that, no way minimizing that. But what I will say is that often the fear is the fear of not knowing or the fear of something that may have happened. Um, and what you think happened may not have happened in quite the way that you believe it has happened. And it is part of this process. And I would like to just say that I am um, down the track a little bit about why I think that's going on. But Tracy Taylor, who I've mentioned before, and you've heard a little bit from her, this is how she actually um, talks about this. And I think it's very, very important for you to hear what she has to say. She says, as far as my own contact experiences, I became very compassionate towards ET beings, as there's so much that humans can learn and benefit from interacting with them. I was fearful of my experiences only when I realized that I seemed to be the only one having them. I didn't know what was going on or why, but there's always been an equal exchange. I helped them achieve their genetic goals, and in return, my healing and psychic ability plus my understanding of life on Earth and so on has been enhanced. They also protect me when I ask them to. Basically, at the start, I misunderstood the greys. The knowing ET part of me initially made a decision to assist them, and the understanding of this can be overshadowed by fear, which stems from our limited human perceptions and reactions to those experiences. So we're now going to go into what I call the secret school. Now, Whitley Strieber, all of you will be familiar with, I suspect, in this room who wrote Communion and many others, transformation of his own experiences. And one of the books he wrote that he really had a difficult time with was what the book called The Secret School, where he recalled ultimately being taken as a young child at night to a certain place in uh, where he used to live as a little American boy and being taught things. Now, there was a lot of problems with researchers about this because it all sounded a little bit too beyond... Oh, it's going to start. I'm going to stop that, sorry, before I get there. Now, Whitley Stryber, before I get to this, he wrote about his secret school experiences as he recalled them. And he said, I've, I'd certainly been there at midnights in my childhood. And he talked about what he was being taught. Now, this is a nine-year-old child we're talking about here. And he said this, remembering the journey outside of time, he said there were nine lessons. And remembering the journey outside of time was another step. I recall that the school had a definite structure. And there had been nine lessons each summer that I attended. The nine lessons involved the manipulation of time, because learning how to use time as a tool is the key to reaching higher consciousness and a real relationship with the beings. 
or parts of ourselves who are already superconscious. The secret school is part of the process of revising reality, a clandestine meeting of minds struggling to restitch the fabric of the world. It's about getting free of time, about remembering ourselves in all our truth. So I was really fascinated by this. So do my clients have this experience? Well, there's a gentleman who you're hearing my voice because he remains anonymous, but this is his memory of being taken to a place in London where he had a similar experience of being taught and go on, gone missing. My very first memory was when I was attending primary school in the East End of London. I remember it was in daylight hours after school finished, in the long summer evenings and weekends. I would get this impulse to play with special friends and go to a special spot at the back of the school. I went back to this spot later and knew exactly where it was, and when I saw it again it was uncanny. It was obviously something about this spot. When I went there, there were other children, but not those I went to school with. I have missing time from that period, for whatever happened was screened out. We'd all meet at this spot and go off somewhere. There was no fear, but an incredible sense of adventure. And then I'd find myself back at home. I can remember mum wondering where I was and becoming quite concerned. I'd basically gone missing. But I had no sense of anxiety at all. It was like, what's the problem, mum? I'm here. As I got older, in my seventh or eighth year, I had clear memories of silhouette beings coming into my room at night. Even the shape of the being's head, it's weird. And when the film E.T. came out, it was like, oh my God, I've seen that shaped head before. It was bizarre. Dwarf-like creatures, small silhouettes, and there was no fear. But having said that, as a child, I could never sleep with the light off. And definitely being afraid of passageways and elevators terrified me. And that was the same for Father Christmas, he terrified me. If we were in Oxford Street in London at Christmas time, Father Christmas was everywhere and it was so embarrassing. I would know when they were coming. I'd be laying down in bed and basically see little heads playfully pop up to play games with my feet. I used to lay my feet flat and they would duck under the bed. And this was all the while my parents were in the kitchen having a cup of cocoa. The closest they'd get to me is halfway along the bed and I would be out of it and fall asleep. <laughs> or maybe they knocked me out. That's one experience he had with um, going to the secret school. Hold on. Okay, so this is what Whitley Stryber has said and I've just mentioned it to you. He had identical kinds of experiences where he would, you know, at night he would be taken. I have met many, many others that have said the same thing. Now let me explain um, what someone else said to me um, in Queensland, in fact. And this is what he wrote to me. This is a gentleman um, who also re um, had recall of his secret school experiences. Your website came as a revelation to me. I had never before heard or read about anyone else having had alien classes as a child as I have had. This has been both a blessing and a curse all my life. I am now 37. I remember having been given physics classes at the age of three or four in a classroom of children of similar age to me. I remember the details well and have an avid interest in physics since then, though I'm not mathematically inclined, so have not known what to do with the information. And there's a lot of it. I used to feel I was just crazy and did a year of physics science, amazing myself and my teacher and other students many engineers and physicists with the fact I could just answer any question. I had never studied and in fact dropped out of school because I was so frustrated. So, what's the veracity of the material that they're taught? Is it credible? This um, lady here, Chris Hale, um, got in touch with me and she has a BA majors in comparative philosophy and social anthropology. A graduate, a graduate diploma in education and is currently undertaking a master's in educational studies in the UWA, that's the University of Western Australia. Chris has got a cat with her and behind her are some of the information she got from the light beings. I refer you back to the narrative I sent you on the light people as to how I was taught multidimensional non-linear methods of thinking. This is possible human to human and does happen but of course the light people have far more expansive knowledge bank. 
I have had quite a deal of interest in it by people in the field of consciousness and learning to whom I have sent this piece. This is some of the material that she downloaded through a, a succession of dreams from the light beings. And I'll give you some more information. The two progressive sheets were done quite consciously with great flashes of insight. There are about 10 or so dreams. And I'm just thinking of John Searle a little bit here. During the period which directly overcame any problems that I had that I could not solve when I was awake. Most of the dreams entailed visual representation, one in particular. I was led by a light person who took me to a black hole to observe, with commentary, thought transfer from the light entity, the separation and potential restructuring of space-time instantaneously. She's got here finest viscosity of time in a constant smashing of the same due to infinite gravity and how the potentiality of new universes exist in the core of a black hole. So, being um, someone who was able to do this, she actually got in touch with two, um, two very highly regarded professors. One was Professor Paul Davis, the Chair of Physics at Adelaide University, and Professor Brian Josephson of Cambridge University. And I'm only giving you a very brief overview of what they said. This is mass we will not see for hundreds of years due to the A-dimensional nature of the spin and lack of fixed parameters. But it actually went into a lot more detail with that. And as I don't really understand what I'm reading, I'll leave that one to you. But what was fascinating for me was, OK, so Tracy and many others say they did physics um, when they were a child. I wonder how much of it they actually understand or know in terms of physics today. So um, I asked Chris if I might, might send to Tracy, who was actually in England at the time, um, some of her drawings from the light beings on this, without saying anything about them, but what could she understand, because she used to tell me she had downloaded physics. And within 24 hours, I actually got a reply from Tracy, which was really great. And this is what she said in an overview. I looked at Chris's drawings briefly, but it seems that they're related to the understandings of beyond light travel and also the connections between the inner world and macrochism and microchism and how they're interrelated. Now, what's fascinating is what Chris responded to that. She said, she's absolutely spot on. Over five to six weeks, I was taught about the viscosity of time and space continuums in my dreams. It's how the inner and outer connect and how we can dematerialize within overlapping continuums. Yes, it's beyond light travel. Good God, some of the best physicists in the world have looked at this and haven't realized what she has seen at a glance. So, what are some of the educational syllabus that I've isolated so far? And I am sure there is so much more. So they're taught quantum physics, new understandings of experiences of time, the connection to all things, new thought processes, understanding of the spatial geometry of thought, new expanded states of consciousness, out-of-body training, telekinesis, telepathy, mind melds, ecology, healing and working with energy, the true history of man's origins, time travel and teleportation. And one of the most fascinating recently is parenting classes. Um, and I'm going to give you a quick overview because I think it's really important. These new children, it seems, need to be approached in a different kind of way than the way that we normally behave. And um, Susie Hansen, who I'm going to mention at the end of my presentation, talked about going on the craft with her son, him going in one direction, her going in another. And she was taken to a room with about 14 other parents. And what she was shown was an interaction she had with her eldest son, where it literally it was like in real time they'd recorded this interaction where she'd said something to her son and her behavior to him. And it was, she said it was quite embarrassing. But then, she said, she was shown how her son perceived her behavior to him. And what they were saying was, with these children, you have to do it differently because they see things differently. So you now have to behave in a different way. And every parent was shown an incident and then shown how they needed to behave from their child's perspective, which is fascinating. Gosh, I wish we had this here. Um, ultimately, though, the bottom line was then she actually got very, very teary because she said, now I know why I'm different with my eldest son to my younger son, because she'd felt very guilty about it. So that was quite fascinating. 
Hypercommunication. It should be borne in mind that the nature of extraterrestrial communications that in a majority of instances star visitors communicate with humans by telepathic transfer of mental images and concepts rather than by words and speech. And this is really where we go into something I'm particularly interested in. Tracy explains it this way. Everything's made up of the same matter, resonating at different harmonics. So the ETs are able to communicate with us, directing thought on subatomic levels, and so activate the subconscious. These symbols are meant to communicate the nature of the macrochism. And that's really quite fascinating. Right, let's just give you another little example. All around the world I meet people that come out with these languages that have had encounters. And it's been fascinating for me because I've wanted to understand more. And again, it's like joining the dots. Dana Redfield is an author of five books. Two of them were about her encounters. Sadly, she's not with us anymore. But Dana I communicated with a number of times. She lived in America. Two of her books, Summoned and The Human E.T. Link, were about her experiences. And I sent her a DVD of Tracy speaking. And she said to me, when Tracy began to speak in the musical language, I spoke along with her, almost as if I were engaging in a two-way conversation, which was in quite, quite incredible to her. I have had many people come to me that have heard some of the languages and say, I do that too, but I never ever talk about it. <laughs> Many different um, drawings and artwork. Um, I've got a great deal more than this, in fact, files of it, where they download it without any conscious thought, and it seems not in trance, but they have an amazing feeling of connection to it. So let's see what Tracy again says about this. The language is a more accurate representation of an individual soul vibration. It means that the language comes directly from the essence of the universal mind or God, which ultimately links all of existence together. The spoken sounds of a particular language tend to bypass much of the linear, logical aspects of consciousness. Therefore, there's no input from the conscious mind. The language has no structure and is therefore not related to the past in any way. Therefore, in its purest form, before it becomes vocal, it bypasses linear space-time. Which is quite interesting, isn't it? The language is a creation of the soul in a way that directly connects with the soul of another unconsciously. There is no framework as the interpretation of the sound vibration is instantaneous and cannot be accurately interpreted into English or any other language spoken at this time. It's teaching us to communicate with our soul and the souls of others. This is one of the steps from words to telepathic communication. These languages, blocks of information come through and uh, to translate it into our tongue would take quite some time. Um, often you would need to fill a whole house with encyclopedias um, to actually translate a message that may be relayed in this tongue in a few seconds. Um, a sample that is uh, close in vibration to ours may, is this one. Yomiratus embrakisendra wali aven ojindra. This means that we are reaching a stage in our evolution where chance is no longer as we imagine it. Everything has a place 
and we are now drawing all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together and we are recognizing our part our part our part in the universe is what she's saying so what Rochelle is talking about there is not only um, the fact that she is aware of her own um, star child dual consciousness but she is aware of what many of the languages are about in the sense that not all of them can we translate in normal ways it's just like using the concept of the word Christmas for example Christmas immediately brings in all this other information from Christmas trees to um, you know what you cook for dinner to the parcels and everything but it's just one word and it's similar to that only a lot more complex the symbols and script are the ancient forms of communicating volumes of information without having to read pages and pages and these I call compressed files and I think there's a very important reason why they're being downloaded at the moment into many of these individuals so I believe that the possibility is that we're being assisted to go from verbal communication to telepathy. And one of the ways of explaining that is what Chris Hale talks about. She says this, for example in lectures, when the lecturer is in full flight teaching and his or her mind is completely open to students, I found I could just go into their mind and absorb the concepts directly. I'm not primarily listening to their words, but in their mind with them, extracting the concepts myself. This circumvents a lot of misunderstanding. I feel these refined children are doing the same. I have taught, have made sure my mind is completely open while speaking. There was thought transplanting going on. My bank of information was merged with theirs and they re-schematized their own knowledge systems accordingly. Of course, symbols would be the written conduit for this, like in non-literate societies, say of ancient Greece, where the mystical knowledge could only be passed on face to face by an adept teacher. But ancient symbols hold the conceptual keys that trigger within the observing mind without a teacher being present. What is happening with people, kids who have these experiences is more a different way of learning than our generally accepted lineal way of learning, reading pages and pages. This is an extension of our symbol trigger mentioned by Tracy. So make of that what you will. Can you tell us what you're writing? Sure. It's really like translating um, information that has been lost, information that was known by ancient civilizations. I'm not able to give you a more accurate description of this writing. My style is really like a shorthand, if you like. It's probably quite messy. <laughs> um, but within each character, again, like the languages, it's really like a block of information in itself. If you were able to um, get three-dimensional, well, depiction of each character, because that's how I see each one, that would be much more accurate. <laughs> With all the information that comes through me, I'm aware of it being multifaceted. When I do healing work, I also will see coding in the air, in the energy field, and I may see this coding in either uh, numbers, like you may see uh, mathematical configurations, or I may see them as dots, or I may actually see them as portals. There are many different ways that you can view them, or you can see them as sound. It's the same with the writing too. And what are you feeling at the moment that you're doing it? What is the sense that you have? I feel very happy when I'm expressing in these ways, when I'm expressing through what people might call ET languages or ET writing. It feels much more natural for me than uh, many of the human forms of expression. I guess this has to do with my dual consciousness and the fact that for me, it is really learning about being human rather than learning about being extraterrestrial. Did you um, hear the last of that? It's more about learning to be human than being, um, ex and, uh, than being extraterrestrial. She's actually having to learn to be human, and that's what she's talking about. And one of the things that I haven't included here is I asked her how she um, read this kind of script, and she was describing that she puts her hand over the top of it and reads it like a kind of barcode with her hand. And what does that five-year-old little boy do? exactly the same thing. Again, what I found with others like Dana in America and many, many others, they do 
a range of interesting, fascinating, complex drawings. These are some of Dana's. I won't go into the explanation here because they're actually on my first presentation. Um, so I'm just really wanting to give you some idea of the complexity of some of the artwork, which certainly is showing some things going on with these individuals in terms of what experiences they're having in um, their encounters. Um, and of course, coming out with the same strange scripts. I see so much of this, it is, it, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, I've got files of it from people from all over the world. But some of it is very similar, some of it is quite different. This is some of Dana's, and she has a fascinating understanding of them as well. This is more of her work. And this is one of Tracy's. As you can see, it is, is very busy, but it's also quite fascinating to see that each tiny bit of it seems to hold a great deal of information. And this is where I'm talking about the complex files. Um, now, Tracy also did black and white ones. Um, actually, to the right of you there, you'll see this strange um, image. This was something that Tracy did probably about six or seven years before she went to Egypt. And she said that this particular one was particularly fascinating to her. Um, and let me just explain what she said about it. She said that this was at Karnak and Luxor, and she knew immediately she took this image with her that it would fit. And she was not only talking about the pyramids being conscious energetic am amplifiers and focusing power source, she also said, I knew that this would fit from a distance. I knew it would fit because I had a strong feeling to take it with me. And then she said, the reason that she had drawn that particular image was this. Horus came to me in a dream. I was in an underground cavern or cave. He was showing me some Egyptian hieroglyphs on the wall. This one was carved into the wall with his snake's tongue. And then he grew in size and I was above the ground looking at this symbol with hills and sunrise in the background. It's a sacred symbol from ancient times to help us awaken and remember who we are which I found quite fascinating. These are some more of her drawings of how she understands an, un, the, the pyramids and other ancient sacred sites. So I'm now going to show you what seems to happen very much. Hi, my name is Rochelle Delia. I've been consciously aware of my extraterrestrial contact now for eight years, but I've been having contact my whole life. My experiences with extraterrestrials have been quite varied. Um, I have gone through a process now over the past eight years and I've come through a lot of the traumatic aspect. And now my experiences have brought me many rewards, um, particularly in the way of healing abilities and I myself have changed in a positive way through them. I have a lot of help with healing work. I speak in many different ET languages and I also write in alien script. These abilities all come quite naturally to me. How were you aware of the fact that you could heal and what is your understanding of the healing that you do? The healing work that I do now has changed and evolved over the years. It first began when I had an experience. I was drawn to go outside of my house at about 3 a.m. and I was looking up at the moon and when I was looking at the moon I felt quite strange and felt to close my eyes. When I closed my eyes I felt lots of different sensations. I felt uh, cool air being blown on my eyes and on my fingertips. I had pinpricking sensations all over my face. I had the sensation of wind circling my head and I could feel it clipping my nose as it went past. I also had sound waves that were going into my ear from a great distance and these repeated over and over. Um, I had tingling sensations all around my head as well. This process went on for some time and when it stopped I felt I could open my eyes again and I felt quite heavy in my body as if there was someone else in my body. I was then drawn to go inside and lie down on my bed and when I lay down on my bed I actually started to perform uh, some sort of surgery on myself. I'd never done this before. I'd never had any experience of healing work 
either done on myself or performing it on others before. So uh, I had my hands away from my body and the healing involved minute movements of my fingertips. Um, I was using my fingers, or they felt as though they were pulling what you imagine to be puppet strings. Um, that's what it felt like. And I would have a series of consecutive movements and I could feel uh, the work going right through and penetrating through my organs. I would then hold my fingers uh, sort of locking a position in place and then I would use a series of very specific movements of the muscles in my eyes which would then unlock or release this pressure. I had to actually move my body into different positions to access all the parts of my body. As the years went by, the healing work that I was doing actually changed. So I was using my whole hand instead of just my fingers. I wasn't actually using my eyes as much consciously. And uh, then later on, uh, I started using toning. I was in, intuitively guided to use toning and then later language came through. After the languages came through then I started using a combination of toning and language and songs came through. Um, I can best explain these as being um, songs that are used for the soul to recognize. Um, souls may remember these songs from other planets, other lifetimes and they help the individual to feel comfortable um, for the particular healing work to take place. Um, really they're used as you might use a lullaby to help a baby go to sleep, it helps them to relax, or a chant is used to switch off the mind and help one to go into an altered state. What um, Rochelle's doing there is actually talking about healing and about the fact that she found after an experience with the moon and the moon is very important here because a lot of people talk about the moon being around or um, a very big moon. My suspicion is it's not the moon at all, that it's actually one of the craft. But she talks about having experience where she was drawn outside and felt these strange sounds going into her, her hearing, to her ears. And when she went inside, she started to do strange movements, which she called psychic surgery, on herself. After that, she was drawn into healing, and she uses toning, she uses different sounds. And what's fascinating about it is that she has a really complex understanding of what she's doing. I work to retune, re like I use a tuning fork, like you would a musical instrument. I do this by bringing in the frequencies the person most needs at the time, both sound and coloured symbols, as we are multidimensional in nature. Now, some of this is going to perhaps confront some of you, but I want you just to... When I work as a healer, I switch from how I normally operate as my human self to my ET self. It might sound a bit strange, but I have been given information about my dual consciousness. I can best describe this as coming into this vehicle having both ET and human characteristics. My human self is very sensitive, very emotional. My ET self is very clinical, very practical, very matter of fact. The healing work that I do, I'm operating in ET. It is really like operating as a surgeon. I see very clearly in the energy field the problem and I 
fix it. There's no room for emotional involvement. My personality uh, steps aside and I hear where the energy field is out of tune. I don't hear in the way that we normally hear. I hear with another sense, if you like, that we don't normally use. There'll be certain places in the energy field that will be out of tune and I work to retune, almost like you would use a tuning fork to hear when a musical note is in tune. How I do this is by bringing in the frequencies that the person most needs at the time. I do this through sound and colour and quite often symbols come through with the sounds that I translate as well. Uh, the symbols are multi-dimensional in nature. They're not like normal shapes that we are used to. I work with a team usually of about six to ten different beings that help me and my team actually changes as I do. Usually I don't like to name the beings that I work with or identify them. I think for me it's just important that I'm aware of their energy more than anything else. But they will give me a name if it helps me to feel comfortable and more familiar with them. The client usually will feel relaxed after a session. Usually they will feel more balanced. Quite often they will leave their body or I will I guess be aware that they leave their body during the session. They may be aware that they've fallen asleep um, but it's actually quite different and they usually leave at exactly the same time during the session. It's usually about half an hour into the session that they leave. This is so deep a work can take place without their conscious mind being involved. So for some of you I'm pretty certain that will confront you a little bit. So I found this really interesting because I've talked to many people that do energy work that have had encounters. What draws them into it? And Tracy talked about being aware of energy in her hands when she was 15. So I wanted to understand more of the, not only the language and the, the depth of their understanding of it, and I'm going to go into that in a minute. I've been looking at science in, because my background's nursing midwifery, I still need to quantify that in third dimensional terms that make sense to me. And I found something really very interesting. And this is to do with some recent Russian research, which was actually translated into German, is the work of von Grezner Fosar and Franz Bludov. And it suggests that our DNA can be influenced and reprogrammed by words and frequencies without cutting out or replacing single genes. And the geneticists and linguists have found that DNA is not only responsible for the construction of our bodies, but serves as a data storage and in communication follows the same rules as language. It just requires the right frequencies. Now what we're hearing here is that somehow or other some language actually can alter DNA. Now what are these, um, a lot of these individuals telling me? That they use language, tones, they're using sound to heal. To me what's the difference? There's something else with that. What they also said was that the nature of DNA are like holographic computers. Information can be transmitted by vibration and frequency. They call wave genetics. They've also found DNA can cause disturbing patterns in a vacuum, producing magnetized wormholes. These are tunnel connections between entirely different areas of the universe through which information is transmitted through space and time. DNA attracts this information, it passes into our consciousness, hypercommunication, in a state of relaxation. Now listen to what Rochelle says is her understanding of what she's doing. I feel very relaxed, very at ease. Like a lot of things have been taken off my shoulders. The beings that were working with me were wanting to um, demonstrate how the different areas in the body actually interact. So when I was placing my hands across and pointing out different sections of the body, um, this was for the audience as well as for you, it was just showing how each part of the body is not independent of any other area. They all work together and it's important that we recognize this, see the body as a whole. Um, there are particular um, titles that are given um, to each part of the body that are related with vibrations um, and 
by expressing the title or the name as you would say um, it actually activates that area um, they also have links with different energies from planets and dimensions um, so if you like we're imagining that the body is the universe <coughs> and all the planets from our solar system and all others exist within this so we are making them all work together <coughs> and within each chakra all of the planets exist um, so we are just activating the appropriate planets for this particular vessel at this time others will be activated at other times but they all exist within each chakra and each chakra is also multi-dimensional in nature it is not as we imagine just seven chakras but each has many layers Well, I find that really interesting when we're looking at what we know about DNA now, um, or at least what these researchers are indicating with DNA. So, let's take this one step more, um, further. I have been really interested from my nurse midwife days on why we have this DNA mystery of ours. Not only have we 223 genomes in our DNA that is a sideways insertion of genetic material that did not come up through the invertebrate phase of our evolution that is also part of, uh, uh, which actually contains everything to do with higher psychological functioning. Where did that come from? That in itself is a mystery that many people are exploring. But what I was also interested in is some of the latest research in, in terms of our DNA mystery, in terms of our junk DNA. What is being said is that, first of all, we only use one-fifth of our brain. Why is that? We have three billion base pair genomes in the genetic code, but only 60 million are active. Why? This information they carry is never read. We only exist on 3% of our DNA. A group of researchers working on the Human Genome Project made an astonishing discovery. They believe the so-called non-coding sequences, which is 97% in human DNA, are no less than a genetic code of unknown extraterrestrial life form. This is Professor Chan, the group leader. What we see in our DNA is a program consisting of two versions, a big code and a basic code. The complete program was positively not written on Earth, he believes. He says the genes by themselves are not enough to explain evolution. No creator, be it programmer from Mars, Microsoft, would not leave a program without an option for improvement or upgrade. The upgrade is already enclosed in the junk DNA. I, he suggests that no, it, it's nothing more than a hidden, dormant upgrade of our basic code. We already know that certain cosmic rays have the power to modify DNA. So it is plausible, he says that the extraterrestrial programmers may just use one flash of the right energy from somewhere in the universe to instruct the basic code to remove its blocks and, and fuse itself to the big code. That would change us forever. Some of us within months, there'd be no more cancers, diseases and a short life and would catapult us intellectually. The comparison would be the difference between the Neanderthal and the Cro-Magnons. This complete program is elegant and self-organizing, auto-correcting software for a highly advanced biological computer. The difference between a short diseased life and potential for a super intelligent super being with a long and healthy life. So what about the downloads, the scripts, the language, the crop circles? Is this part of the energetic upgrade um, via our DNA? Remember, we're talking about a flash of the right energy. So what are these as part of that upgrade? Are these part of us waking up? Are they helping us to wake up? Are these the ancient symbols that are actually assisting this process of evolution? Certainly, many people are affected by them, not just because they're amazing to look at, but when are inside them feel all sorts of very powerful frequencies, including healing. And Freddie Silver in his book, Secrets in the Field, suggests that could it by implication be that the crop circles are an, a universal language? We keep hearing that word. But what else are they doing? Hold on, I'm going to stop that just for a second. So we're looking at the potential here that in some way, possibly, those compressed files or downloads 
I wonder, and I'm only wondering, whether in fact those compressed files in fact are the new software for the new computer. That when we finally get switched on, if that's what, what Professor Chang is talking about, we're going to need a new operating software. I wonder if, in fact, these downloads are compressed files and the new software for the new computer. I really don't know, but it's an interesting thought. Now, just before I go any further, I just want to give you an overview of this. We're actually doing very well for time, so I might even be able to answer some questions. Suzanne Hansen is a very dear friend of mine who's had experiences all her life. She's a former teacher. She now runs UFOCUS New Zealand and has had many conscious experiences. She's been taken aboard craft many, many times. She's also been shown her children on the craft. And she's going to confront some of you that perhaps still feel that a lot of the Zetas and Greys are in fact robotic-like creatures because that's not been her experience. And it's not been the experience of many of my clients. Now, I can't go on other people's research and I have no intention of going into that, their research because I don't actually know how they've worked or their clients or anything like that. I only know what my clients are telling me. So I'm only going for this moment in terms of the understanding they've given me of what they understand about these beings. One of the things that Suzanne has told me is that when she's on the onboard craft, she has particular connection to some Zetas. She knows them well. And she said, and they have a sense of humor. And she said, apart from that, you know, they are, she has found them to be extremely loving, extremely compassionate, and extremely kind. And one of the incidents in regression this was that she told me when she was learning things on the craft to use her mind was when one of the beings was accompanying her down back home and she said the being in his mind showed her that he was sending an etheric arm around her to let her know that he was with her and he was looking after her. And it was his way of showing that he, you know, he was caring for her. And she perceived this and to show off, to show what she had learnt, she sent an etheric arm round him and he acknowledged the fact that she'd learnt well. Now these are really interesting little details. She even talked about from this experience that when she was being told she was going to meet someone special, she described skipping along the corridor in behind the little being and how the being was highly amused. So because you don't see the face move, you don't need to because everything is in the mind melds and in the telepathy. Now this is a particularly fascinating um, experience that Suzanne had. She was told to come and see me and have a regression. She flew over from New Zealand to Perth. Not exactly cheap, but she was told that this was one. She shouldn't have any I, um, come in with any mandate, any particular experience. She had to be open to what we explored. So this was totally um, in any way an, uh, uh, not a conscious um, experience. But I want to demonstrate something very, I believe, very profound. My name is Suzanne Hansen and I'm the director of a New Zealand UFO sighting and contact research network called UFOCUS NZ. I have experienced contact with extraterrestrial species since early childhood. Today I will describe two directly related experiences on board craft which demonstrate how some souls are altered, educated and fostered by ET species as a part of ongoing constructive programs and agendas for the future benefit of mankind. In 1962, when I was eight years old, I was taken on board a craft and into a large familiar room that I had visited often with other human children. Here we learned to interact and socialise comfortably and competently with other species of ET children, using enhanced telepathy and sentiency. On this occasion, I was taken aside by an adult grey and asked if I'd like to meet another child somewhere on board the craft. Before I go any further, I just want you to be aware of the little cradle that you're seeing in this picture. And that particular cradle, when Suzanne first saw it, she burst into tears. And she says, I know that cradle. And she described the fact that when she'd had, and she had a very difficult childhood, that when she'd had a particularly traumatic time on Earth with her human family, she was put on that cradle and it actually had certain frequencies that would re rebalance her energy field. And she burst into tears because she had sh been shown such compassion and such love. 
The Grey telepathically conveyed thoughts, pictures and explanations to me regarding this child and its life. But the volume of information was too great to retain consciously and I was just left with an overall impression regarding meeting a new friend. The Grey told me about the child with considerable care and I sensed there was something he was not yet telling me, but he was seeking my cooperation with this meeting. We proceeded to a small room and waited, and I felt excited about meeting a new friend. Two greys entered the room, with a vibrant blue ball of light floating in the air between them. As I stared at the ball in surprise, having expected a child to arrive, I experienced profound feelings of love and familiarity, and sobbed at these unexpected thoughts. The Grey told me I would love this ball of light in the future, as it would become my son. He referred to it as both a source and a complex system, and said I had known it since before my own birth. The Grey began an intense mind-to-mind -mind download consisting of three streams of information. The first just calmed my emotions and confusion. They wanted us to get to know each other, future mother and son, and they would observe how we related to each other. A second stream embedded extensive information into my subconscious concerning the purpose of this project, the genetics involved in the creation of my son's body, and the dual education he would receive on board craft, both as a child and in his source or soul state, which he told me had been enhanced and altered by them for a specific purpose. Finally, a third stream brought my mind back to the present as an eight-year-old child and they left me to play with the ball for a while. I tried to relate to the ball by first asking it to bounce, but it just floated there, unresponsive. I felt disappointed and sat down on the floor. Suddenly, I felt as if I was being watched and became aware the ball was thinking at me. It descended down onto my shoulder and we were soon racing around the room, communicating happily. But, all too soon, the greys returned. They expressed satisfaction that the meeting had gone well. Two of them took the ball of light away, and I felt deep sadness and longing. The grey assured me that we would meet again many times up until the day that this son would be born. So we returned to where the other children were interacting. In 1983, now aged 28 years old and near to full term in my first pregnancy, I was taken on board craft. My memory begins with me being assisted down a corridor by two tall entities, a mixture of species. They expressed concern for me as I had been ill throughout the pregnancy, and so they tenderly supported me as we entered a small room. They helped me onto a shelf-like bed, and we were joined by a grey. He explained that they were bringing someone to merge with me, and I was not to be concerned as everything would be fine. Holding his hand over my forehead, he told me he first needed to retrieve some memories from my subconscious mind, which had been embedded there in childhood. Immediately, my mind was filled with images, emotions, and memories of past meetings associated with a ball of blue light, and I became really tearful as I realised it was the soul of my child soon to be born. As he calmed my emotions, a group of ET children came into the room, bringing with them the now familiar soul or ball of energy. He stated these young entities had grown up on board craft with this soul and they would play an integral part in supporting him in his life. There was a real air of excitement as the process of merging began. The grey slowed my metabolism right down to prepare my body for the intense energy of the soul, necessary to prevent shock to my body. During the hypnotic regression with Mary, my voice became really slow and almost indistinguishable at this point, and my body felt cold and numb. Slowly the soul entered my body and the body of my child-to-be. I felt infused with light and weightlessness as the grey slowly brought my metabolism back to normal again. He stated my son would be born late, which he was, and that he would be accompanied through his life by watchers, a terminology to describe a protective system they would provide for him. He added there are thousands of children being born in a world like him, part of an extensive project to create positive changes and accelerated evolution from within the human species.
These two experiences illustrate the complexity of the soul state and reveal extraterrestrial involvement with souls incarnating on this planet for specific purposes. It challenges us to reassess our current understanding of the soul, the soul's existence before incarnation, and the idea that the soul evolves not just through repeated cycles and lifetimes of personal experiences, but can also be enhanced, altered and educated by external forces or species. Or species, and I will just say that again for you. These two experiences illustrate the complexity of the soul state and reveal extraterrestrial involvement with souls incarnating on this planet for specific purposes. It challenges us to reassess our current limited understanding of the soul, the soul's existence before incarnation, and the idea that a soul evolves not just through repeated cycles or lifetimes of personal experiences, but can also be enhanced, altered and educated by external forces or species. Now this is going to, for some of you, I think, be quite a difficult concept, um, and I understand that. But what it seems to be and suggesting to me, and obviously um, Richard Dolan talked about it yesterday, that we are not just perhaps looking at the fact that we're um, looking at extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, transcendentals, and perhaps even some from our own future. But the bottom line seems to be, as this 15-year-old that was seeing Uncle Ted and Grandad as orbs of light, that they are also part of this big picture of these beings that we are interacting with or having encounters with. And there seems to be far more going on than we ever thought. And there is that, the sense that there is no actual separation in that sense. I think for the one thing I want to say now is that the abduction, the so-called abduction scenario, I participated in a thesis by Simon Harvey Wilson that was the comparisons between shamanism and abductions in Western Australia in 2000. And what Simon discovered was the parallels were quite fascinating in terms of transformation, healing, etc., etc. And my sense is that what we're seeing is a modern day shamanic experience where we are being challenged to transcend our fears, to be prepared for our multidimensional nature. And this is all part of that challenge. Are we going to go beyond our limited fears to actually accept and be prepared for working in um, uh, through not only um, dimensions, but beyond that. And this is what our new body perhaps is, and our new hard drive and our downloading is preparing us for. So it's actually challenging us from many, many levels. Um, and some obviously don't need that kind of experience because I'm seeing a broad range now of experiences from the 20 to 30 percent of the abduction or so-called abduction experience in the sense that I will say so-called because for many of my clients when I've taken them into hypnosis and I have asked their subconscious have they on any level any level consented to this part of their human experience and not one of them yet has said to me no most of them will tell me it was before they came here and some of them have actually said um, ask that question in that space themselves and then describe themselves as a ball of light. Who, uh, and some of them have also said that they were non-human before they came here, they were extraterrestrial, and they have undertaken to come to this planet to assist this planet to evolve. Now, it's not for me to judge that understanding or that experience. If this is what that individual, and I will say to them, does this make sense to you? Does it resonate? And every time they will say, Yes, but one of the things that was quite fascinating with one of the young ladies who was aware of her dual consciousness, she said to me, yes, I did, but I, she said the extraterrestrial part of me was cool with it, but she said the human part of me didn't realize it was going to be so hard, which is fair comment. But what I'm saying is this is only from their understanding with their subconscious. It's not for me to judge or assimilate or even um, try and in any way um, put any of my own thoughts and feelings with this. What I'm trying to do with my work is to give per a person the understanding that makes sense to them in terms of understanding their own experience and reality. And the, the, the bottom line is 
that what I find is no matter how strange, weird it may be, even to being shown um, one of their parents not being human, which is pretty confronting for most people, and, and one of those was actually a policeman, by the way, Gary, um, it was quite challenging. So um, what's interesting for me is this is not something they would consciously want to say or even admit to, but they say to me, on a deeper level, it actually resonates. And that's all that matters to me, is that it makes sense to them. What it allows them to do is integrate this experience and heal and move on and expand in their own way in whatever makes sense to them. So instead of actually being in conflict with their third dimensional paradigm and trying to fit this experience into that box, they accept that they're operating on two levels of human experience. And once they can accept them both as being OK, they can actually grow with that, integrate, heal, and live normal lives and normalize it, which is the very difficult in a world that denies their very reality. So with that, I hope I've given you something to think about. I also hope that you understand I'm not expecting you to take on board everything that I've shown you. All I would like to do is offer you what I'm learning and uh, understanding from my 1,600 cases so far. And this is what um, I've put together as a way of myself trying to make sense of it. I have no idea if how far I'm right up the, uh, um, with this or not. But if anything makes sense to you, or if it even just incites your curiosity, then that is basically all I need to do. And I want to thank you all for being a wonderful audience. And I have got a chance for a few questions. So if you've got any questions, I'm quite happy to answer them. It's a very interesting question. They've never actually talked to me about um, where they um, downloaded these languages. Um, some of them say it is a download um, and what have you. But interestingly, I met a, a young a gentleman who was English who came to Perth and he came to me about his experiences. And what he did say to me in terms of the telepathic part of that was that um, he'd actually lost his scout cap um, which is his brand new cap and he'd gone to the scouts and when he came home he didn't have it and he'd had a strange experience and when we explored his experience one of the interesting things he said to me was when he was up on the craft everything he was hearing around him in his mind was a jumble he said but it was like I had to tune my mind to a frequency uh, just like you would a radio signal and he said and I could hear everything very very clearly he said which was quite fascinating it's the first time I'd heard that now, um, from what I can gather, it's all telepathic on the craft. Um, but these seem to be downloadings. And the way Rochelle describes them as soul languages or universal languages. So if we take on board, and that's a big leap for some of you, I do understand, that perhaps some of these individuals that are now in human form actually came from other star systems or whatever. And they feel like their family is out there. And that's what they will tell me. Um, you have to wonder whether or not this is the, from their origins. And I mean, this is really tangible stuff for them because the emotional side of it is very profound. And many of them say, I don't want to be here. I don't like this place. It's not like um, home. And to give you an example of what a five-year-old actually said about her understanding, she said to her parents, so this is terribly confronting to parents. Um, she was five when she said this to her mother. She said, you're not my real parents. My parents are in space. And her mother, thankfully, had been aware of her own experiences and so was able to sort of honor what she, her daughter was saying. So her daughter, she said to her daughter, well, if you're not, if that's so, um, she said, I don't really look like this, her five-year-old daughter said. And her, daughter, and her mother said, well, what do you look like then? Could you draw it? And she said, no, because you'd be frightened. 
Now we're talking about a five-year-old girl. I have heard this so many times from different people saying, I feel like I've been adopted. My family doesn't feel like my real family. And even though I love my family and my parents, I feel I don't belong. I feel I belong out there. And there will be people in this room that relate to that, absolutely. Now, are they crazy? Are thousands of people crazy that are feeling like that? Or is it in fact telling us something that we need to be aware of? You know, and, and that's all I'm, I'm putting to you. So I hope, as I say, I can't give you any more than that. Okay. Oh, hi. Hello, Mary. Hi. Um, I came um, up to date, so I was very anxious to hear you uh, above all the other speakers that I've heard already, and they're all excellent and got lots to tell us. And I think you've got a very special um, package of information to give us. And I have to say, having downloaded it, my head is, is hurting a bit. And I'm trying to sort of fit together in my own head all the threads um, that have already been there and then feed in the, the new ones that have mm -hmm. come through you. Um, I'm involved in a project to actually prove the physical existence of graves on this planet, which I uh, regard as a very important stage in us being able to prepare our minds to take in the, the new information. And that's just by the by. And it happens to be called the Star Child Project, so there's a plug for the Star Child Project. Mm -hmm. But what interests me is what I picked up, and I'm a little bit muddled because so, so much of the new stuff has come in, um, is this interaction between the beings on their ships mm -hmm. out there and us here, the humans. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's very important that we actually start to think about what, what it means to be human. And what I got from you, I couldn't quite remember where it came mm -hmm. from. It was Michelle talking about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's Sue, I think it's Michelle. 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 Um, she was saying that they actually come to us because they need to experience the human side of them. Mm. And I feel this fits in very much with the process which is going on now on the planet, of which the information about the alien, the physical mm. existence of the aliens is part. But it's also what I would call human self realization. Mm. It's actually finding out that we are a species in its own right and not just some sort of evolutionary or genetic mm. accident or, mm. or even um, the sort of, I don't know, there's, there's, there's all this stuff about the Anunnaki and mm. how we actually came to, into existence at all. You know, that we are a slave species mm. originally and the, and the subspecies and the lesser species and um, we could actually be a super species. Mm. And so I want you to comment on that. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do feel that um, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of um, different, differing opinions about, you know, why they're doing this and what's their agenda and are we actually just ultimately be going to become biological fo fodder and they're going to take, take us over and all the rest of it. And I, I think I'm a pretty logical kind of a person. And the way that I look at it is this. If they are taking us onto these craft and teaching us cosmology and all the different things about the origin of the species, teaching us how to use our minds, teaching us how to heal, and all those things. Why would they bother if they're going to take us out, or just why don't they just leave us alone? And let's face it, we're doing a pretty good job of taking ourselves apart anyway. So for me, it doesn't seem very logical, unless there's something I'm missing here, to bother to help these, the new, um, new human, if you like, to grow and expand and change and become multidimensional unless there is something else going on here. And I certainly can't see it would be ultimately to take over the species. I do believe that they have um, a lot of programs and some of those are to do with us but some of those are to do with understanding themselves and I will just give you, as, as part of that answer, um, a gentleman that just recently I did a regression with, and he was taken up onto a craft, and he told me that the craft was 32 miles long. And then he said he saw thought forms in a kind of aquarium. And he said to the beings, what is this? And they showed him some technology, which apparently creates a kind of wormhole into other universes. And they said, what we're doing with you is what we're doing in other universes. We seed other universes and we create, just as you will do one day. Now, you can take that or leave it as you will, but it seems to me that if they've bothered to change and alter our genetics and gradually enhance our abilities in the way that they're doing so that we can become multidimensional, why would they bother? if it wasn't um, an, an agenda which seems to me to suggest we are being helped 
to change and to grow and to understand our multidimensional and the magnificent nature of what we could be, because I believe we all have the potential for that. And perhaps, just perhaps, they're giving us a helping hand. And I believe, from what I've seen so far anyway, that, that that's the case. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mary Rodwell, thank you so much.